Hello, Mink back here with Planescape Torment. When we left off, we just talked to Deidre, I believe. Uh, this is a new session, so forgive me if names are a little fuzzy. But one thing occurs to me that I never talked to more here. Where's the option? I've seen you, Chief. How do I use these bandages? I already know how to use the bandages, but... I want to see you, Chief. I have nothing at the moment. I guess he had nothing interesting to say there. All right. Expected, honestly. Hmm. Actually, didn't Mort say he was looking for a new body? Before you is a giant skeleton in ornate bronze armor. The armor has been bolted onto the skeleton's frame and a series of elaborate symbols have been carved across the breastplate. You wonder where the skeleton came from. You weren't aware they made humans in this size. The huge blade in its hand looks like it weighs as much as a wagon cart. Hey, how about this skeleton, Mort? Will it do as a body? Mort grins. Uh, is that a yes, or... Oh, sorry. Mort flows up to the head of the skeleton, stares at it, then floats back down, studying the armor and the blade as he descends. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I think this'll do. Should I second guess myself? Ah, all right then, give me a second to pry the head off this thing. As you are about to do so, you suddenly stop, and your eyes are drawn to the skeleton's armor. Something about the symbols engraved on its breastplate makes you pause. If these skeletons are guardians, then disturbing them may awaken them. Okay. Let's examine the giant skeleton carefully. The skeleton's intricate bronze armor is riveted onto its rib cage and shoulder blades with a series of iron bolts. As you study the frame behind the armor, you notice the same iron bolts are set into the skeleton's shoulder, elbow, pelvic, and knee joints. A mass of thick leather cords and heavy knotted ropes run along the length of the skeleton's arms and legs woven in such a pattern that they resemble muscles and tendons. Mm. Let's examine the armor. Despite the armor's obvious age, it looks well cared for. It shines brightly and the symbols engraved on the breastplate seem to flow in the firelight, shifting slightly whenever you try to focus on them. study the symbols. Almost unconsciously, you let your gaze relax as you look at the symbols. After a moment, the symbols cease shifting and resolve into a trail of runes that run up and down the breastplate. Strangely enough, the interlocking pattern of runes remind you of chains. And with that thought, you suddenly recall that these runes are some sort of warding enchantment. Well, Let's study the runes and try to recall the enchantment. You study the pattern of runes as they weave their way across the breastplate. 
On its most basic level, the runes are a lesser armoring enchantment, but several skull-shaped runes and spherical tracings along the edges of the armor make you suspect several greater necromantic and wording enchantments are woven in as well. Touching the skeleton will most likely cause it to awaken and defend itself. Well, let's see if we can dispel the enchantments. We have 500 experience. You suspect that marring the rune pattern along the breastplate could unravel the enchantments, but it looks difficult. The pattern is complicated, and scratching out the wrong portion could cause the skeleton to animate. I don't know which of these is correct, so let's compare the pattern to the enchantments in the Tome of Bone and Ash. See if you can determine how they can be broken. From what you can make out from the Tome, it seems the armoring enchantment applies only to the breastplate. The necromantic enchantment allows the skeleton to be raised, but it is the warding enchantment that gives the skeleton its limited awareness of its surroundings. You'd guess that if you were to mar the skeleton's wards, it would interpret it as an attack, unless you blinded it to your presence first. Okay, so we have to do the warding, the warding enchantment first, because that gives the skeleton its limited awareness. So, that would be number two. Here goes. Mar the runes maintaining the warding enchantment first, then work backward through the rune pattern, cancelling the necromantic, then the armoring enchantment. The work is difficult and nerve-wracking at first, but slowly your mind begins to focus, and the runes begin to unravel beneath your attack. Within minutes, the giant skeleton has been stripped of the enchantments binding it. It collapses, falling to the floor with a crash of bones and a heavy clanging noise. Damned pile of bones. 800 experience for that. You wait for a moment, but no one responds to the sound. Moving quickly, you sift through the skeleton's parts on the floor. Most of it is too heavy for you to hold or to be useful, but you discover a piece of the skeleton's breastplate with the majority of one of the broken enchantments engraved on it. You have a feeling that it could prove useful. I'll just take it then. Ooh, looks like my skills have increased. And Mort has gained a level. Whoa. -oo. That's a dialogue. I could have swore there was a yeah. Okay, they didn't really drop anything. What's up? So, let's level up more. Wow, he gained the full 10 hit points. Two from his con bonus. Saving throws improved, fighting skills have improved. for all of them and get free 800 experience. What the heck? Yeah, it just jumps right to it. See if you can dispel the enchantments woven into the skeleton's breastplate. Warding first, then work backward. Dispelling the enchantment is easier this time around, and the runes quickly unravel beneath your attack. Within minutes, the giant skeleton has been stripped of the enchantments binding it. Remembering what happened to the first, you catch the skeleton before it falls, and with a grunt, slowly lower it to the ground. Let's see what we got this time. 
Yep, another 800. You quickly over rummage through the skeleton's remains, and once again uncover a piece of the skeleton's breastplate. Like the first, this one also has a fragment of its broken enchantment engraved on it. It could prove useful. Yo, another one. What the heck? Although I'm tempted to do the other dialogue option with more. So let's do it. Yeah, we already been through this. I don't know, this thing looks more than you can handle. <coughs> then what in Bator did you ask me if I wanted it for then? Practicing your cruelty skills? More Bob's indignantly. indignantly. And after all I've done for you. I was thinking of your safety, Mort. I'm worried attaching your head to this thing would hurt you somehow. Mort stares at you for a moment. What, did we get married at some point? What's all this, I don't want you to get hurt, Wash? Mort glares at you. If you really cared, you'd find a way to get my head on that giant skeleton's body. Uh... Okay... Yeah, I am not doing that. Ugh. Now I have to go the long way, examine the armor, study the symbols, study the runes, see if we can dispel. Warding first, then work backwards. <coughs> Easier this time around, blah blah blah. Let's see what we got. Another 800. Blah blah blah. Once again, we get a piece of the skeleton's breastplate. Oh, a fourth one. And a wall I could loot that I didn't notice the first time. Hello, F Mr. Free 800 experience. So let's see what's hanging on the wall. And examine those pieces of breastplate. A crescent hatchet. Rune of Lesser Warding. Upon closer examination of the runes covering the surface of this breastplate, you think you might be able to unlock the rune's power and use it to invoke a primitive warding enchantment similar to the one that protected the giant skeleton. Activating the rune will destroy the breastplate, however. So... Invokes armor, teaches user armor. Oh, so it's like a spell. I got you. So I guess this acts like a scroll. Less rewarding. Rune of armor. Wait. So they both teach armor. Either casting or copying the spell will destroy the breastplate. Upon closer examination of this breastplate, you realize you didn't mar the warding rune beyond recognition. In fact, unlike the other breastplates, the spell that maintained the integrity of the giant skeleton is mostly intact. So much, you could either cast the runes as a spell or copy them into a spell book and keep it as part of your arsenal. Either casting or copying the spell will destroy the breastplate, however. Hmm. So, I guess this one can only be used 
but it can't be copied like that one. Greater warding teaches shield. And this one is a copy version of shield. Interesting. Crescent hatchet, two to seven slashing. But you need axe proficiency, which we do not have. But that is better than my fist irons. weighs 10 pounds. Wow. Wow. I don't know what world these people live in, but they're... A battle axe does not weigh 10 pounds. That is crazy. Or you can carry that too because I'm weak. Jesus Christ. Yeah, give me the book back, what the heck? Ugh. Ten pounds. I'm gone. Legs. Freaking crazy. Anyway, this is the beginning. So let's see what's down here. Alright, those go to the same spot. I guess I should have figured. Oh. Save the game. Adventure. You there, please hold. Oh, another runner. State your business. Lean in as if to whisper to him and snap his neck. My only business is that I am bound for the exit. I mean to cause no trouble. Technically true. And honestly, they would probably like that answer. Dustman frowns. He seems skeptical. There are guides that can direct you to the antechamber. In the antechamber, do not wander the mortuary unescorted. Thank you for your assistance. I will go speak to the guide. So we go. You see a tired-looking man in a black robe. His narrow face is extremely pale, and he doesn't look as if he has been sleeping. His shoulders are slumped, and the flesh sags loosely beneath his bloodshot eyes. He looks so lost in thought he doesn't even notice you. Greetings. my journal. The man turns to face you and makes a slight bow. You suddenly notice that his eyes aren't bloodshot so much as they have a red tinge to them. I am so ago, how may I? He suddenly seems to notice your scars and the corner of his mouth twitches. I'm sorry, Sarah. Are you lost? Uh. Let's go with yes. Well then, the corners of Soigo's mouth twitch again, as if in anticipation. Let me call the guards to lead you out. Stand for a moment. He looks like he is about to call the guards. Snap his neck before he can call out. Leave quickly. Wait. Interesting options. But I think I'll go with... 
Hold a moment, please. There's no need to call the guards. I came in for an interment earlier, and I just got turned around in the halls. Can you please just lead me out? I still don't know what an interment is, but... So Ugo nods, and the corner of his mouth twitches. Why, of course. These halls can be confusing to visitors. No harm done. But you are not permitted here in the mortuary after nine bells. Let me open the front gate for you. Thank you. Hey, 500 experience for that. <coughs> Any day now, so we go. Very well. The front gate is now unlocked, but you cannot re-enter. Can I ask you some questions before I leave? Soago nods. You may ask your questions. Do you know someone named Farad? Farad? Of course I know him. He frowns and his eyes gleam red. A ghoulish man. No respect for the dead, and even less for the living. He is a scavenger, a collector. Collector? Collectors make their living gathering corpses and bringing them here to the mortuary. We then make sure the bodies receive a proper burial. So if a collector found a body, mine for example, they might have brought it here and sold it to you? Yes. Suddenly, it's extremely important that I find this Farad. You know where I could find him. I know he resides in the Hive, the slums outside the mortuary, but I do not know exactly where. Some of the other collectors may know if they'll talk to you. I had some other questions. I'm missing a journal. Have you seen one? A journal? So a ghost seems confused. No, I have not seen one. All right. If I may ask, are you all right? You look tired. So a ghost manages a weak smile, and the corners of his mouth twitch slightly. I have recently taken ill, minor fevers, nothing more. Sometimes they make sleep difficult. Anything I could do? Sogo shakes his head. No, no, thank you for your concern. I will endure. He frowns slightly. Was there something else you wanted? No, I won't trouble you anymore. Thanks for the information. You there hold. That's a walker, so we can easily avoid him. And I guess that's it. So hopefully we did everything here in the mortuary. So let's save the game again. Adventure. Yes. And let's leave this place. You there, hold. Actually, is he named? No. Okay, let's just leave. Hmm. I guess we are being scoped out. Now we are entering territory that I only vaguely remember. I mean, I didn't remember all of the mortuary, so this will all probably right. be more so. Hey, I'm gonna be a watch, Chief. Just look natural. 
casual. I don't think we're being watched, Mort. This door has been sealed, of course. The mortuary window, it's so dirty and stained with soot that it lets no light through. And honestly, that seems kind of fitting. They are called dustmen, after all. <laughs> dustman, dustman. Why don't they call him Dust Woman? Or is everybody in the faction required to be a man? So the women are confused or transitioning, whatever. Pox, he was on the one receiving log. <laughs> this cowled figure is hunched by the mortuary gate. His face is obscured by the shadows of his hood. What little you can see of his chin, which is covered with stubble and what appears to be a foul green and purple rash. The rash seems heaviest around his neck, fading as it crawls up to his chin. Greetings. The figure doesn't budge. There is a moment of silence, then he responds in a high-pitched voice that sounds more suited to a girl of ten years than a man. Hi! And no, I cannot do a high-pitched voice, so that's what you got. Who are you? Paxamai, hi. Uh, Pox? Mother and father named me. Wished a Pox on firstborn. A curse given, came true, it did high. Again your eyes are drawn to the purplish-green rash covering Pox's chin and neck. What are you doing? Wait for debtors, do I, hi. Debtors? Corpses? Why? Find a debtor, take him to the gate, get some jink, then again I wait, hi. Yeah, you, we can f figure out he's a collector, but we can ask why. A debtor's to a dust man, what a copper's to a collector. Bring them to dead, and they give you a copper at the gate they do, hi. Why do the dust men pay for the dead? The street's clean, debtor's put in their place, streets don't stink, dead aren't lost kept inside gate all happy high. What do the dustmen do with these debtors they buy? Haul debtors inside gate, put them at slabs, cut them up, bury them, or make them walk high. We've already seen this. What do we have? Why can we ask? Make them walk. Hi, they make some get back up if the debtor gives the dustman leaf to, and the debtor becomes a skulls or a zombs. Scales or Zoms. That's almost as bad as Zomfy. Is the front gate the only way inside the mortuary? Hi, only debtor or dustmen go in gate they do. You want Pogs make you debtor again? Uh, again? Hi, many time you ask, Pox always do? Huh. How many times exactly? Many time, hi. So, we've met before? Hi. What do you know about me? You a debtor who don't stay debtor for long, hi. Deal square what pox you do. Do you know anything else about me? You a debtor who don't... Okay. Do you know anything else besides that? You a de... If I keep asking that, he's just going to keep asking that, say that same thing. The answer is yes. I can ask him to kill me again. I can ask to pretend to be dead. I'm curious about that, but we'll save that for later. Actually, you know what? Screw it. We'll do it now. How about I pretend to be dead and you sneak me in? Let Poxy you play deader. You play deader good, Pox get you in. Hi. 
tend to be dead. 500 experience. Pox watches your performance without a sound. When you get back up, he speaks. Hi, Poxilia. You want to be sold now? Well, since we already got the experience for that, no. Hi. Do you know someone named Farad? Hi, Farad. Collector, big name has weight. Cast long shadow, it does high. <sighs> Collector. Collector, gather debtors. You know where I might find him. Hi, in the hive here he is. Somewhere's high. Can you be more specific? Hi, somewhere's in the hive he is. For rod hide he does. Very hard finding he is. Not worth finding he is. Not worth finding. What do you mean? Hi, many hates him, other collectors even. Sharegrave hates him, not like Farad at all. Hi. Sharegrave? Hi, Sharegrave, big name, carry weight, cast long shadow, he does. Tell Pox what to do, he does. Would your boss, the Sharegrave, know where Farad is? Updated my journal. Hi, Sharegrave knows darks, he does. No Farad a hiding, he does. Sharegrave in Ragpicker Square, many blocks west over here. Hi. Say Sharegrave that Pox send you, tell him Sharegrave become Share Copper with Pox he will hi. <clears throat> Some other questions. I've lost a journal. You wouldn't happen to have seen one, would you? Hi, no journal. No journal have I seen. Things get lost in the hive, never found again. Maybe journal one of them, hi. This guy's speech pattern is very interesting. And what does he always say, hi? Not only is it hi, it's spelled like the Japanese anime young girl, hi. It's like, oh. Uh, no, I guess that's it, Pox. Sorry to disturb you. Hey, these things. I remember these things. Are you talking symbols or something? You see a tall creature with a shock of white hair. Its skin has a greenish cast and a pair of goat horns protrudes from its forehead. It is dressed in long, flowing robes and appears to be floating slightly above the ground. Greetings. The creature turns to face you and a series of symbols appears appear around its head. The symbols have a slight glow about them and they just hover there. Oh, for the power's sake, piking Dabus. Dabus? Dabus? I'm probably going to call him Dabas. What's wrong? He's a Dabas. They speak in rebuses. These annoying word puzzles. If you don't know what he's saying, then we better find a native or some other way to communicate with him if we want to. They're an annoying bunch. My bet, they can speak. They just would rather piss everyone else off by trying to puzzle out what they're saying. <laughs> What's a Dabas? Chen is their janitors for the Lady of Pain. They float around breaking, fixing, and patching up sigil according to her whims. They're worse than corpse flies. More size. You can't swat them though, or the lady will get upset. Lady of Pain? Who's that? She runs this city. You'll know if you see her. She's got these blades around her face. She's about the size of a giant, and she floats off the ground, just like these guys. Mort nods at the Davis, who is looking at you both. Nobody knows much about her. She doesn't speak much. All you need to know is that you don't want to make her angry. If you see her, my advice, run. <laughs> I see. The Dabas waits patiently, its hands tucked into its sleeves. A series of symbols materialize above its head, then they vanish, and a question mark appears. Well, why not? Try and strike up a conversation, see if you can translate what the Dabas is saying. Okay, a thousand experience. You ask the Dabas several questions, trying to get a feel for the rebuses that appear above its head. 
It is extremely patient throughout your discussion, giving you easy sentences to translate. After a few minutes, you start to get the hang of it. It feels like you've done this before. Maybe you can help me. The Dabas waits. Who are you? The Dabas inclines his head slightly, and a stream of symbols appears above his head. I am a Dabas. It doesn't exactly say who you are, though. That's just what you are. I had another question. What are you doing? A batch of symbols appears above the Dabas' head. I attend to my duties. Honestly, I agree with the second one. Very descriptive. But, let's ask about the Lady of Pain. A lone symbol appears above the Dabas' head. This one shows a metallic female mask with blades coming out of the sides. Just looking at the ghostly image makes you uncomfortable. Uh... I guess that's all we could ask, so goodbye. The Dabas bows slightly, symbol swirls around its head, then it turns away. We have a frightened... Hey, you beat me with a hammer, man. A frightened hive dweller. You see a man in tattered clothing. As you approach him, he suddenly stops and begins to look around, frightened. You there, hold a moment. Greetings. The man looks startled and takes a step back. Eh? What you be wanting, Cutter? His voice is shaky and he seems taken aback by your scars. I have nothing on me, so as I don't, and my rags are not worth the trouble. <laughs> Run, and I promise you won't get far. I had some questions. Now, calm yourself. I'm not here to rob you. I had some questions. He keeps a safe distance, and his eyes dart from side to side, as if expecting something to step out of the shadows. Questions, he said? And uh, what might those questions be? Can you tell me about this city? What do you want to know about Sigil, then? What is this place? The city, the city of doors, the cage, a place where all doors lead to and from. The center of the plains, and gets most of the backwash from all places too. Some say this is where everybody ends up at one point or another. City of doors? Eh, I, you see, Cutter, the city is... He frowns as if struggling with the words. The city's got a batch of doors scattered throughout it, and you see the doors... He frowns again, then sighs. The doors... Let me rattle my bone box with a little more sense. You see, these there's doors all over Sigil, but they don't always look like doors. They're more like portals, see? And they can be just about anything. A window frame, or a picture frame, an archway, a barrel hoop, a space between a table's legs, or a statue's legs. And you're saying all of these things are doors? He frowns again. Doors. Portals can be anything that's closed on all sides. It's hard to tell what they are unless you got the key to the door. Is that how you get here, Cutter? Through door? What makes you say that? Eh, well, you don't act like you're from around Sigil, see? What are those keys you mentioned? Each door's got a key, which makes it open, see? Most times, you don't even know there's a door around, unless you got the key. Then the door opens, and you can step through and take your chances. Trick is, you know how I was saying that doors can be anything? Well, so can keys. It could be a tune you hummed to yourself near a door, thought you'd be having about pastries, or a little jiggy do, or maybe a key's an object, like a piece of glass, or a cobblestone, or a broken tooth, anything. Sounds pretty confusing. You get used to it, you do. Well, where do all these doors go? He shrugs. Doors can go anywhere, Cutter. Some don't even lead to the same place twice. He sighs. You see, such is the way a number of the doors that they lead to almost anywhere in the plains. Anywhere. It's just that there are so damn old many of them, it's hard finding one that takes you right to where you want to go. I see... Can you tell me about s 
isn't the city sigil, so why would I ask him about sigil? That's what I thought. Can you tell me about these slums? Eh, he looks at you warily, and his brow furrows in confusion. Why you be wanting to know about the hive, Cutter? Why is it called the hive? He looks puzzled. I don't know. He looks frightened that he doesn't know the answer. Must have reached met some people, mayhap? Well, what's around here of interest? It, uh, depends. Depends what you find interesting, Cutter. I'm looking for a good time. No. I'm looking for someone named Farad. Name's not one I know, Cutter. Who's he? He's a collector. He thinks, well, the most likely he is Kip in Ragpicker Square, then. You might want to look there during the day that is not a nice place at night. Where is Ragpicker Square located? It's a few blocks from here. Go west from the mortuary as far as you can go, and you'll run right into it. Careful when you're around there, though, Cutter. The collectors there don't always wait for a buddy to die before collecting on him, I. Got it. Can you tell me about the Lady of Pain? The Mistress of Sigil? You've not heard of her? You must be blessed or more... Cluel. Oh, clueless. I eh, know a little about Sigil, indeed. Clueless, got it. He laughs weakly. Ladies' words law around here in Sigil, he thinks for a moment. Except she don't say much. Dead silent she is, actually. That's funny. Ladies' word here is law. Except she doesn't say much. Some law. But I'll go with, what else can you tell me about this lady? He looks at you warily. Don't want to be talking too much about her, Carter. You don't want to cross her shadow or be singing her praises, all right? Now let's say no more about it. Right when your bone box about the lady is dim. Dim indeed. All right, then. He is not going to know where my journal is. I'm missing a what? I guess he doesn't know what a journal is. Farewell. A dust man just going, oh, all right. Three hive dwellers, Ooh, some hive thugs, an angry hive dweller. Let's talk to him. Uh oh. You see a man in old tattered clothes. As you approach him, he makes a detour to avoid you and keeps walking. Greetings. The man ignores you, begins to walk faster. Sir? He turns, glancing briefly to the right and left of you, as if looking to see if you have any friends with you. He draws a dagger. You'd best leave me be, or be wearing the steel between your ribs. Farewell, then. Yeah. Mort, go attack him. Me? I'm gone. Stand back. This is more annoying than it's worth. Holy Christ. Thank God. Right. We have someone else running around. Ingress.
You see a haggard woman wrapped in rags. Her hair is disheveled and dirty, and her complexion is extremely dark. Burns cover her arms, and her right hand is a fused lump of flesh. It looks melted, like wax exposed to a great heat. Greetings. Updated my journal. What is it you want me? You want to me. The woman's accent is thick, and you are not having, and you are having difficulty making out what she is saying. You want to me to leave? Not leaving this city, so I'm not. I can't try it. It's not a city. It's a prison. It's everywhere. Everywhere. There's worlds. There's her eyes gleam madly. Plains that be sinking sands, fields thirsty, nettles be. Sightless worlds where you limbs are given life and hate. Cities of dust whose people are dust and whisper ash. The house without doors. The twilight sands. The singing winds. The singing winds. She starts to sob quietly and she seems all out of tears. And shadows. The terrible shadows there be. Where are these places? Where's? Where's them places? She flings the lump of her right hand in an arc, gesturing at the space space. These all here be doors, doors. Here to everywhere. We already heard about this. Doors. You, you're not knowing this? She squints at you and her teeth start chattering. Tell you I will. Beware every space you walk through or touch in this thrice cursed city. Doors, gates, arches, windows, pictures, frames, the open mouth of a statue, the spaces between shelves. Beware any space bounded on all sides. All these are doors to other places. What do you mean? Every door has a key, it does. And with this key, they show their true nature. An arch becomes a portal, a picture frame becomes a portal, a window becomes a portal, all eager to take you someplace else. They steal you away. She raises the lump of her right hand, and sometimes what's on the other side takes a part of you as a tithe. What are these keys? The keys, the keys number as many as the doors in this city. Every door a key, every key a door. Her teeth start chattering again if she's cold. And a key is, a key is anything. It may be an emotion, an iron nail held between your second and fifth fingers, a thought thought three times, and thought once in reverse, or it may be a glass of rose. And these are all keys that open doors. Updated my journal. Yes. Her teeth start chattering and she quenches her mouth closed and squints her eyes. Yes, can't leave, can't leave. How did you get Updated here? Updated my journal. From. She seems to calm slightly and her eyes take on a thousand leagues stare. Came from a place else from here almost a life ago. Hummed a tune by a glade with two dead trees that had fallen together. A brilliant door opened in the space between the cross trees, showed me the city on the other side. I stepped through, ended here. Why can't you go back? Tried! She try tries to sob again, but notes the tears come. Tried! All doors here lead to other places. She shud shudders and grips her melted right hand. Went through thrice ten portals, some a purpose, some a accident, none of them right. Can't find way back. There must be a portal that can take you back. Can even leave here, the square, and there the place of death behind the gate waits for me. She points at the mortuary behind the gate, then turns back to you, her face desperate. Can't go anywhere in this city. Can't go anywhere? What do you mean? Anything could be a door. Any arch there, any door here, could be a portal. Don't know the key, could get a sense to another horrible place. Her teeth start chattering again. I've got to stay away from the closed spaces. All could be doors, could have a key on me, and I not knowing it. You're, you're afraid to go through any door or arch because it might be a door portal. She nods, her teeth chattering. How long have you been afraid of this? She squints. Since the last time I walked through the last portal, the place where my hand... She stops. Since my tent turning, I'm in me four tent turning that now. Her teeth begin chattering again. Thirty years. You haven't walked through any door for thirty years. Her vision seems to clear slightly. She looks up at you, her teeth still chattering. To be too afraid to walk through any door, that's... <laughs> 
How mad are you, woman? You must be a fool to not walk through anything that might be a door. We'll be nice. If you got here, there must be a portal that can take you back. It's only a matter of finding it. She smiles. Her teeth aren't chattering because she is cold. They are moving around inside her mouth. Her gums twisting as the teeth shift about. They rise and recede as you watch, chattering as they rattle against each other. What? She hisses at you. Only takes one portal you step through an accident to drive the fear into you. I went through thrice ten, lost my hand, burned my flesh, lost my senses. She looks at her feet. No more, no more. Die in a city you're afraid to leave then. Leave your fear rule you. Farewell and good riddance. I'm sorry. If I can find some means to help you, I will. Farewell. Updated my journal. I'm gone. Anyway, where did those other two... Had at that time. Don't you know it's dangerous to interrupt spellcasters while they're evoking a spell? Lucky for you, I was only practicing. Well, what is it you want? Uh, I guess we don't want anything. Bye. Just wanted to disturb your magic. Well, <laughs> and yet another interruption. A person cannot even find privacy within one's own home. Please leave before I summon the guards, or better yet, I'll try out a new spell I've been toying with. My apologies. Farewell. She has a name, though, so I hope that doesn't come right. back to bite me later. Sev Tai, Death of Names, Quentin. This obsidian monument has names chiseled on it. This obsidian wall has thousands of names carved onto it. I'm assuming it'll say that of all the walls. Yep. Hello, Death of Names. You see a dust man with a crooked smile frozen on his face. Despite the smile, his eyes are as dull as stones. His right arm is shorter than the left, and he keeps it tucked to his side as if cradling a small child. Readings. You see a dust... The scrolling was weird there, sorry. The dust man's eyes slide over you. Name. The way he speaks the word, it sounds like the tolling of a bell. Also, it's more like, name. I... I don't know. No name, no name, can't help you. The dust man speaks in a curious sing-song voice. Need to give a name if you want to see where it's died. <laughs> what? Updated my journal. Given a name when you're born, give it back when you need it no more. Death of names, death of names. His eyes swim across the monolith in the walls of the area. Buried many names here, death of names has. Tell me a name, I'll show its grave. Uh... Dianara. His eyes roll to the back of his head, then pop back. 
With a wild gleam, his eyes run across the walls of the monument, scanning the names at inhuman speed. He then points at a section of the wall. Buried. Examine the spot he's pointing at. Chiseled into the black stone and tiny cramped writing is the name you requested. It is almost lost beneath the sea of names around it. I had another name. Name. Doll. He shakes his head. Not dead yet, that name is. Not buried here. Not time. Not time. Can you bury a name for me? He nods, then unfolds his small hand from where it is cradled on his side. It looks atrophied. It is the size of a small of a child's hand. Cost Jink to bury a name. Three coppers, three. Well, DNR is already buried. It's not time for dolls, so no name today. Farewell. Dr. Sev Tai. This woman's face looks broken and she is covered in scars. They look like bite marks and fingernail cuts. She is cradling the sheds of several rags in her hands and is staring emptily at the wall of the monument, at the names there. Greetings. Sst, get you back! The woman's teeth peel back, displaying a row of black canines. What you want of Sev Tai? Uh, what's the matter? What wrong? Those cars. Ka-ows. Chaos men wrecked my cart, attacked me, and killed three of my sisters who tried to stop them. Not sisters anymore. Now there's nothing but names on this memorial wall. Chaos men? Chaos men, a faction, they says. What they are is an addled bunch that runs wild through the hive and does whatever they please. We never did no harm to them. Then they lope in like dogs and tear apart anything within their reach. Who are these chaos men who attacked you? They're a hiver gang, a bunch of adult sods that call themselves the... the starved dogs barking or some such barmy nonsense. <coughs> Their actions were unjust. If you wish, I can see that the matter is rectified. If three deaths they caused, and three deaths shall these starved dogs suffer. A copper earring in your purse if you pent three of those murdering sods into dead book, Jig. I'll see to it that they're put into dead book. Can you tell me where they might be found? Go out the south gate spireward from here, then walk around the block until you comes to a place where men run in circles, howling at the sig sky. There's the starved dogs, they are. I'll go look for them Updated then. Updated my journal. Hmm. It's Quentin, I have to say. The man before you looks to be middle of height and ears. He is stout with a thick, bullish neck, and his shoulders are hunched as if a great weight was pressing upon them. He wears an impatient look as he stares at the black monolith in front of him. Greetings. The man throws you a glance. There's room, Cutter. No need to ask my leave to stand here. Actually, I wanted to know what this monolith was. It's a tombstone for the plains. He scoffs. Graveyards and names are scratched on that rock. Can only hope my name's the one that'll split the stone in twain. He points at the base of the monolith. Quentin, right there, hammered it just hard enough to send the damn thing crashing down. Tombstone for the planes? Aye. Quentin smiles ruefully. The dusty scratched the names of the dead on this monument here. He gestures around him. And on the walls of this place. Not enough space by my reckoning, but no matter. They do their best. Can barely read half the names. Well, what are you doing here? Reading the new arrivals. Try and find a new one every day. Try and remember if I know them. Nothing more. So, the dustmen record the names of all that have died on this monument. Aye, they scratch them on this rock. And scratch them on the walls in this place too. Quentin scoffs. I don't know why they take the trouble to take counting of the dead. 
The Dusties have more care for the living. The living? Aye, you know about the Dustmen mourners that come to this place? They aren't mourning the dead, see? They're mourning the living. You can barely get a word in on in them edgewise without him asking to mourn some poor living burg for you. Why do they mourn the living? You got me there, Cutter. He shrugs. Might want to put the question to them. Seems to me the dead are thrice worth the pity of any poor sod living in this pit. He nods at the monument. Every name on there is best in my is blessed in my book it is. Ever know anybody who came back after their name was put on there? Number two is pretty good, too. You mean come back from death? Quentin shakes his head. Not a one, Cutter. Everything that lives dies, and that's the way it thinks. He shrugs. Still, considering the planes go on forever and all, I suppose then it is possible. Suppose so. I had some other questions. Can you tell me who that crazy dust man is on the other side of the monolith? Quentin smirks. Not the sanest bird in the cackle house, is he? That barmy's death of names, Quentin scoffs. Though death of sense might fit him better. What does he do here? He's the keeper of the memorial area. Knows where all the names are around here, and he can point out one if you need him to. He's a little adult to be sure, but he's helped me a few times. He shrugs. He's also got the duty of carving new names in when their owner pass on. <laughs> I see. Thanks. And with that, I think we will call this an episode. So, we will continue exploring this outside the hive area in the next episode. Till then, this is Mink. Goodbye.